What about the range of scientific research in your books? Are they more recent findings in research or are they like a wide range from like, you know, from the beginning of science to now? Yeah, I mean, I do. I love finding, you know, like even studies from like the 19th century, you know, those really peculiar experiments that you're often not allowed to perform anymore. So I do kind of touch on on those. But yeah, I really, I think science has changed a lot recently. Um, it's a lot more rigorous than it ever had been. Like there's a lot of emphasis now on finding robust um, discoveries that you can replicate again and again. So I do try to lean on the the kind of most cutting edge research, really, because I think that's also the most reliable and the most meaningful. Yeah, definitely. And it's also important because I think people, especially with psychology, I think people only know so much and there's still so much to be explored. And we forget that there's always new research coming out. (laughs) And it's people like you, like we need you to explain this new research that's coming out so that we move forward. Yeah, that's exactly how I see it. And, you know, often like, um, I think we still have like a lot of um, misconceptions about the way the human brain works or, you know, about um, human psychology that the latest science is kind of correcting and, um, and you know, it's uh, full of so many new insights. Um, but that's what I want, want to really bring to people. Great. Yeah, I'd love to get into it. So today I want to talk about your newest book, The Laws of Connection. First of all, what fascinates you about this topic? Again, it's like, um, personally, um, I was a really shy teenager in that I couldn't even kind of go into a store to kind of buy like a CD uh, without um, feeling like really nervous about those basic interactions. And I got over that, you know, from like, basically, when I started going to university, like I really got over my shyness to quite a, you know, quite an extent. And the same, you know, when I started my journalism degree, I was having to meet, um, like my journalism career, I was having to meet like a lot of new people. Um, you know, you when you interview someone, like even if it's about science, you have to have this kind of bond to get them to open up and to talk about, um, you know, what excites them about their research. So that kind of journey kind of, I'd always wondered, you know, like how did I make that transition? And then I just came across like about, Three or four years ago, I came across these new papers that just really told me, helped me to understand why I'd felt shy before and also how I'd overcome that shyness. And that was what I really wanted to share that with other people. Um, and my book in the end isn't just about kind of shyness. Like I think what surprised me actually is that all of us, you know, no matter how shy or confident, introverted or extroverted we are, we're all carrying some uh, misconceptions, false beliefs, um, kind of wonky intuitions that can lead us to to kind of not not show our appreciation for others, and to you know they're just these psychological barriers that prevent us from having the most meaningful connections that we could with other people. That really appealed to me because I, I think there's something that everyone could learn from this research. Like there are so many of these barriers and so many different areas of our relationships, whether it's talking to a stranger for the first time to having a conversation with someone that you've known for 20 years, or whether it's like, um, you know, trying to get over a really big fight with your partner, or trying to support them through a terrible period in their life uh, when they've undergone some kind of trauma. Um, There's just so much of this research is so relevant for all of these different areas. So, you know, that, that inspired me because I thought, you know, I wanted to write a book that could be useful throughout our lives. It's not just like telling you like how to talk to strangers. It's telling us how to be better um, friends, colleagues, or family members. Amazing. Um, Why don't we first touch on why social connection is important for our physical health? And then I'd love to get into all those like psychological barriers that you mentioned. Again, this was another inspiration for the book because we've known for decades now that uh, social connection is just so important for physical health. Um, you know, there are hundreds of studies all pointing in the same direction, and we can see it from other social animals as well. And so it's really undeniable. And when you do these uh, meta-analyses, which are where you kind of combine the results of all of these different papers, you can really get an idea of, you know, you can quantify how important that is. And what you find is that all of these other lifestyle factors, like whether you smoke, how much alcohol you drink, whether you're overweight, um, how much exercise you do, 
um, whether you take medication for your blood pressure, you know, things that we are absolutely certain are fundamental for living a long and healthy life. Well, those factors are really important, but social connection is right up there with them. It's like one of the best predictors of who's going to um who's going to survive and who's going to die within any particular year. Um, so it's so, so fundamental. And the, the big question then, like you said, is that why would that be the case? It's kind of, it's quite amazing. But um, to understand why, I think we have to go back to evolutionary history. And you could see that as humans started living in bigger and bigger groups, um, social connection just started to be so fundamental to survival um, because we needed all those pooled resources and protection um, of our kind of peers from like the predators that might be uh, threatening us. And what this means is that when we feel um, isolation, we start developing a certain physical uh, response to that. Because once you were separated from the uh, group, you would be much more vulnerable to being attacked. And so we started to develop this physiological reaction that um, would help our wounds to heal and would prevent bacterial infections in those wounds. Um, and so those responses are things like um, increasing inflammation in the body and increasing the amount of blood clotting factor. Now, that is great. Like We evolved it because it's really useful if you are actually attacked. In the short term, it's going to save your life. But in the long term, those things are like really big risk factors right. for cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's disease, um, stroke, you know, all of the things that ultimately are going to kill us in our old age. So if you're feeling chronically lonely, like not just like for one day every so often, but if it's like day after day, year after year, you know, those risk factors eventually start to impact your long-term health and, and can ultimately kill you. Wow. This whole time I thought the loneliness was just mental, psychological, but you're saying it, there's a physiological response to, to to being chronically lonely, the inflammation. Yeah, exactly. It's, you know, and that fits with like this very big kind of new understanding now of the, um, the nature of the mind-body connection and how, you know, mental health is so intimately connected with physical health. Amazing. Okay, so let's get into your favorite concepts. Like, let's talk about what you share in your book. What are like the biggest myths that you like to bust? I think my favorite one, and this was like the study that just like set it all off. It was, like, it was so transformative for me. And it's a phenomenon called the liking gap. And essentially what the research shows is that you have, like when you meet someone for the first time, you often have like a really great conversation with that person. Like you just hit it off. They There's that instant rapport, that chemistry. You know, you you go away from that conversation feeling great and like you really, really like and admire and respect that other person. But you have these nagging doubts that maybe they were just being polite to you and actually they don't like you as much as you um, liked them. And the research just, I think we've all felt that, but the research shows that that is really common, this liking gap. And it can last a long time. So there were studies of people at um, university, like roommates living together. And even though they were seeing each other daily, um, they still felt the liking gap for about seven months after they'd first started like sharing a room, um, which is kind of amazing. So do you, you clarify, liking gap is when you like someone, but you are not sure if they like you back just as much? That's it. But the research shows that actually they do like you as much as you like them on average. <laughs> so both people like each other, but it's kind of like there's a doubt there. Right. You, un you totally underestimate how much you like them. Like basically, yeah, we're going through life not realizing how much we're loved because yeah, each person is feeling this. That's why it's so profound, I think, because... When you feel the liking gap, it kind of discourages you maybe from like exchanging numbers, suggesting that you meet up, up a second time in the workplace. Like it could be a colleague who you like really admire and want to collaborate with, but you, you're too shy to just because you feel they don't like you as much as you like them. You're kind of just too shy to to reach out and say, like, could I help help with this project or whatever? So yeah. Yeah, it's it's kind of true in all areas of our life, and I think it's one of the big reasons that we um, that we feel kind of lonely and that we crave more connection. It's just because we're missing all of these opportunities when 
there were people who really did like you as much as you like them, but we just, we didn't have faith in that. Yeah. And I think it's hard to gauge for some people. It all comes down to someone's level of confidence, right? Because it's naturally, if you're more shy or insecure, you might think, oh, this person might not like me as much. So how do you close this liking gap for the people that experience it? And I feel like this is so relatable and so common. Yeah, that's what I think it is. And so the research had looked at kind of, um, you know, does it correlate with levels of shyness? And it does. But actually, even people who are not especially shy still feel it. So it's, I think it is almost like a universal experience. Like you say, it's like really important then that we overcome that. Kind of a firm believer that just kind of awareness of this can actually be really um, reassuring to us. Like I, I find that personally that when I have those doubts, I just kind of remember the liking gap and I kind of recalibrate uh, my expectations a bit. I, it just makes me a bit braver to reach out. Um, like you still have to do so respectfully. Like not everyone is going to have the time or inclination to be like your best friend. But, right. you know, we can just try to reach out. If we really, you know, we can be honest about our feelings. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be a declaration of love. It's just like <laughs> suggesting you get coffee. You know, it's not mm-hmm. a big deal, even if they do um, reject you. And the, the research just shows they're much less likely to reject you than you think. So, yeah, I think awareness is important and practice. I think that really uh, is kind of fundamental. But the research shows the more you talk to kind of strangers and um, practice your social skills, push yourself out of your comfort zone a little bit, the uh, easier it is to calibrate your expectations. So it kind of shrinks that um, that kind of liking gap and the anxiety you might feel. That makes sense. The more practice you get, the more you can gauge like how much people will respond. Because <laughs> if you're not good at connecting with people, that gap, you're saying the gap is bigger. Yeah, that's exactly it. And a lot of us don't just don't get enough practice. Like, you know, we might kind of talk to strangers only when we really have to, like, you know, you're kind of networking um, for your job. But like, that might only be like once a month, you know, it's not necessarily enough for you to remember those interactions and how positive they were. So, you know, the research has shown, if you just ask people to do, uh, to kind of strike up a conversation with a stranger, just like, you know, a few times a day for a period of like one week, even that period is long enough for them to start to feel much more optimistic about the the opportunity of connection. Mm 